Today what we're going to talk about is the Noble Eightfold Path. The, um, the Eightfold Path is similar in one respect to the Four Noble Truths in that this path can actually be discussed in different ways. We have a way which is often presented to the lay people in a very general surface way as a guidance system for in life. Now, as a meditation teacher, what we do when we teach the Eightfold Path in relationship to the meditation, we teach it slightly differently. So I'm going to show you a couple of other ways that you can uh, teach the Eightfold Path uh, that is not quite so general and um, surface on the gross level, but takes you a little bit deeper into the understanding of it. Now, traditionally speaking, the Eightfold Path was always taught as right this and wrong that. And right and wrong sounds almost like black and white, and most of us know that life is not exactly black and white. So what we have done, and uh, I understand some other uh, monks and venerables had done in the past also, is come up with a system of harmonious links that actually fulfill this description of right uh, in, you'll find out what I'm saying as I go along. For instance, let's take the first part of the uh, Eightfold Path, and this is right uh, view. If we were to say right view, I would say it to you instead. It is a harmonious perspective which will fulfill right view. So I'm not getting rid of the old way of saying this. I'm just kind of refining it a little bit for you. So harmonious perspective means that we change our perspective from the angle of atta, or the personal side of things, to the impersonal view of things, the impersonal perspective way of looking at everything. And, and what this does is it opens up um, our life so that we don't have to have a reaction to things, but we can look at things more easily without a personal opinion to see essentially what's there and only what's essentially there instead of adding all kinds of unessential assumptions around what is happening in the present moment. The right view was a view that led to harmonious behavior and harmonious uh, lifestyle and all these harmonious uh, um, angles of living your life. So using the word harmony in this harmonious presentation is harmonious versus discord, discord harmony and discord. So it's a little gentler way of saying right and wrong. Of course, if we don't have an anatta perspective, we're going to fall into craving, and we're going to fall into a lot of tension and tightness in our mind and body. So this, of course, is the wrong view, or an inoperative view. So you see there's all these ways we can do this with English. It's kind of interesting. The second link is, was always called uh, right thought, but what we're going to say is we'd like you to have harmonious imaging in your mind. So if you have a harmonious image in your mind, you are going to have a wholesome image without tension and tightness, which leads you to further action, which keeps you in the realm of happiness and what it is that you want to have happen in your life instead of the um, unharmonious uh, thoughts or the, um, you could say, intentions, wrong intentions. You want to have the good intention and you want to have wholesome thoughts. Why are thoughts so important? I think thoughts are really so important because mind is the forerunner of everything. And when mind is the forerunner of our actions, we have thought, we have word, and we have deed. 
and mind is the forerunner in all of this. So if we keep our imaging correct in our mind, we can guide that. We have some volition or some choice to do that. So we have harmonious imaging, we will have right thought and that will be fulfilled. The third one is they always call this right speech, but speech is not the only way that a person communicates. I think you'll agree with me that when you're communicating with someone who is actually there, you actually have their communicating with their mind, their speech, and their body. They have body language. They have, uh, when they're starting to think something, they have verbal action inside before they even speak anything. If a person pays attention to what mind is doing in regards to their thinking, their speaking, and their action, they will always have right speech included in all of their communication. And this is what we want you to do so that you go easily in the direction of the wholesome path. The next one is harmonious movement will fulfill um, right um, action. And the uh, right action was what you do with people, what you actually do with people. But the harmonious movement, once again, this is called watching the movement of mind's attention. You remember I told you that on the deepest level, your meditation is actually learning to observe the movements of mind's attention in order to see how everything actually works. And so what you want to do is you want to be able to uh, notice the movement of mind's attention so that you don't jump in to action without watching what the mind is doing. Everything comes back to mind. So if we're watching the mind's attention, we are going to be able to uh, have the right action in our life. The next one is harmonious Harmonious lifestyle is a little bit more broad than just saying right livelihood. Watch what happens. If I say to you, harmonious lifestyle, I'm challenging you to have the, set yourself up in life so that you have a job and a home and activities and friends that support a Buddhist lifestyle. I'm encouraging you to set up a home, even if it's an apartment, a small apartment, where there's a tiny place for you to be by yourself to practice your practice. Uh, and I'm encouraging you to be working in a job that fulfills your uh, eightfold path and guides you with your precepts. It's in keeping with your precepts so that you're not involved in anything that has to do with killing or weaponry or poisons or things like that will automatically come to be. So we're not confining it just to that. We're saying that having a supportive lifestyle is going to solve the problem of having a wholesome livelihood in that will be a byproduct of this. So we're talking about the whole, uh, the whole uh, field of this, not just narrowing it down. When we say uh, we want you to keep up a harmonious practice, uh, normally if you, we used to say right effort, but remember I told you that right effort, we, the meaning of this has been kind of lost. Many people will point to right effort and say, what you need to do is put more effort in or work harder. You need more effort. It means work harder. Get going and you'll succeed. That's not what we want to put across with right effort. Uh, there is that kind of effort to put a little more energy into your meditation and a little more interest into your meditation. But we should refine and say that clearly. We need to put more energy in. You need to put more interest in your object of meditation. You'll be OK. But what we, when we say effort, we are um, deceiving the person if they have defined this as just work harder. 
because that's not what it was. We, remember we told you right effort actually was, in Buddhism, these four steps of notice when there's an unwholesome in your mind, release the unwholesome and relax, bring up a wholesome and smile and return over and keep that wholesome going as long as you can. So it was these six R's that we were uh, saying were actually the right effort described in the text as four basic steps. And uh, this is a wholesome practice. So we're saying set up a harmonious practice. You know, practice is really interesting because um, in over time in the West, I'm not so sure what's happened, but some people have told me in the Asian countries I've gone to a similar situation, where actually people meditate when they go to the temple or when they go to the retreat. But a lot of them don't keep it up going home. They don't keep it into their life because they don't see the interrelationship of it. And probably the most important thing that we can do for the world today in this millennium is to help them to understand that life didn't belong here and meditation over here. They actually belonged hooked together. And in hooking them together, we're showing you that life is meditation. Meditation is life. You heard in some of the other talks, some of the measurable um, results that Buddha wanted to see, how he wanted the outcome to be for the practice. And I guess, I guess what I want to say to you is, suppose somebody came to you and said, I would like you to learn to ride a 27-speed bike and cross the country in a road race. And you, I'm going to give you $50,000 if you do this for me. Well, I'm going to practice and I'm going to learn to ride that bike and go across the country by Ken. I can build a monastery for $50,000 for heaven's sakes. So, so I get the bike, and I decide I'm going to do this, and I know when it's going to happen. So I ride it once a week. Do you think I'm going to win? I don't think so. <laughs> so the point is, if you really want to learn to do something right and graduate from a 3-speed bike to a 10-speed bike to a 21-speed bike to a 27-speed bike and perfect the riding of that bike, you are probably going to practice a lot more often. So one of the things about Buddhism is we can't say things like it's not possible to reach Nibbana in this lifetime or, you know, people's paramis aren't the same now as they were in the time of the Buddha, so we can't have that happen. Let me try to clarify something. The Buddha showed us, uh, the Buddha showed us how precisely to reach Nibbana. He gave us the specific recipe with a number of different elements and ingredients in it. Now, just to deviate slightly, my grandmother used to have an angel cake that she made at home, and it was 12 inches high. The cake was about 12 inches high. Now, the way she made this cake, the cake had 13 eggs in it. And she took the eggs and she separated the eggs, the whites and the yolk of the egg, when she blended the recipe. So she beat the whites of the egg until they were stiff. Then she took the rest of the sugar, the egg yolk, and all of the other ingredients of flour, and she put that into the recipe. She put it in the oven, and it came out 12 inches high. I remember my mother, she got the recipe, and she remembered the eggs were in it. And she just threw everything in the bowl, and she mixed it up. She put it in the pan, proper number of ingredients, and put it in the oven. And it came out this high. <laughs> it was very sweet. It was lovely to munch on and chew on while we had tea. But it certainly wasn't that angel cake that was 12 inches high. The thing about Buddhism is he's left, the Buddha has left us the instructions and precisely how to achieve uh, the liberation of the mind. But if we don't do it 
all the time how can we retrain the mind my grandmother used to have a saying about changing a habit she said if you have a habit and it's a bad habit what you have to do is create a new habit and then you have to do that habit for 30 days long and once you've done it for 30 days long it will become a new habit this is what we have to do we have to let go of these um, unharmonious and um, unwholesome tendencies bring up the wholesome tendencies, systematically training mind, because we are retraining mind from an old habitual tendency of holding on, of becoming involved with everything, of becoming involved in craving and clinging and suffering, to releasing and relaxing and smiling and opening up to a clear mind and what we can do with that clear mind. And the potential of a clear mind is absolutely remarkable. This is the phenomena coupled with what we're going to talk about in our next talk, which is equanimity. This clear mind, balanced in equanimity, probably has the answers for a lot of things in the world not only in our families, in our communities, in our states, in our countries, but probably in the world and even for universal space flight, whatever you want to dream of. We're going to have the same issues wherever human beings go. So we have to look at what it takes for people to be able to come up with creative new kinds of solutions. And it takes a balanced mind and it takes equanimity. So after we have a harmonious practice and we are practicing the steps of this right effort and fulfilling it, we have to pay attention to having a harmonious observation that we develop. And this observation is what is our mind doing? This is the question. What is your mind doing? When you come out of the house, and you walk to the car, okay, what is your mind doing? And even better, if you have an argument with someone or you're upset about something and you get in the car and you start driving, the question is, who's driving? Are you still thinking about, oh, I should have said this, I should have said that. Oh, he said this, but I should have said that. You know, I'm right and he's wrong, but you're driving. The question is, are you driving or are you thinking? You see the difficulty? So a lot of the problems we face in life is the question of, what is your mind doing? Where is it and where is your attention right now? That's the question. So harmonious observation fulfills right mindfulness. Right mindfulness is to remember to keep watching where mind is, noticing where it is, so that if you are walking, you're only walking and you're not thinking of something else. I think we make a little bit of a mistake when we put our mind on our walking and say we're walking, 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 or we're lifting, 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 or eating, eating, eating. The idea here is the same. I am just coming from a little different angle of how we accomplish the same thing. The idea was to make sure you're only walking or you're only uh, reading or you're only doing a particular task. The idea is centered around can I help you focus more through your experience of meditation. But I think what happens is sometimes if we start just walking, 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 our mind can get too pointed and too concentrated. We have to be very careful of that because if we're concentrated here, we're closed to new ideas. But if we're opening our mind and relaxing constantly, we're moving towards an end result of Nibbana, which is no tension and tightness, and a totally open and pure, clear mind. And that's where we want to go. So we have to look at what's happening here. Since mind is the forerunner of everything, why not step one 
step more and watch what mind is doing when you're doing something else. Just see what happens. I think you're going to have an interesting experience. Now, with collectedness, this is a harmonious collectedness, is what we do is we attempt to have a harmonious collectedness of mind in order to get the right level, the right tone, the right degree of concentration. The word concentration is a difficult word for the Westerner. When we grew up, we learned to ride our bike very concentrated way, <laughs> okay? And when we learned to roller skate, we were perfectly concentrated on that and nothing else. And when we go into school, we're concentrating very hard. And when we're in work, we're concentrating on doing better than the next one and the next one and the next one. And we're so concentrated, we get a headache and we get stress and we get depressed. And this is what happens to us. I can't speak for the whole entire world, certainly, but I can say there's a better way if you examine the openness of mind. Because if the mind has no pressure on it, the brain can operate so much more easily that that gives you the spaciousness in mind, the spaciousness and openness in mind, that you are able to just relax and think of solutions. And what we are after in this particular time, this millennium, are peaceful, cooperative solutions for co peaceful coexistence. This is what we want in our community. This is what we want in our city. It's what I want our leaders to do with other countries. It's what we want to have happen for the world. Because let's face it, you know, with 7 billion people on the world, right now we're going to have to think of ways to get along in order to survive. We have the technology. We can come up with the solutions we need to come up with. We can figure this out. But we have to be able to cooperate without the bias of, oh, you always do this, and oh, you might do that, and oh, we, this sort of thing has to stop. We have to stop projecting. We have to stop assuming. We have to stop overthinking. We have to stop these things and come to a clear mind base. And a clear mind base is not closed. A clear mind base is open and cleaned out. So what happens if we aren't cleaned out? What happens if we have to do some work in order to, um, to clean ourselves out uh, and so we can actually take off with this kind of practice and we can uh, actually work with uh, uh, this kind of harmonious practice and progress well? well what do we do if we hit a wall, if we run into a wall and we can't figure out why we can't move forward. What do we do? Well, one of the things that we found in the past 11 years was that sometimes this is a phenomenon that happens for some people and other people it doesn't happen to. A people will come to a retreat and you'll have anywhere from 25, 30, even 40 people at a retreat and there will be a portion of those people that just hit a wall and they can't go forward. They can't move with loving kindness. Um, they, if they start with the breath meditation, they get stuck. If they start with the loving kindness, they get stuck. So what happens for these people is we need to clean out the rubbish. This means that in our mind, there is like a gate that is there in our mind. And behind that gate, there is a whole lot of rubbish trying to push its way out. And one of the things that we're doing when we go into meditation is that we are uh, very courageous because we are uh, approaching something that nobody should look at, <laughs> okay? And that is what's behind the gate. Um, these are all the sorrows, all of the uh, angers, all of the things we think we settled and we lock them up 
and kept in our head uh, from past grievances, and we haven't let go. When you start to meditate, one thing that happens is you are attempting to purify mind. And when you start to purify mind, you are offering yourself the chance to open this gate. And behind comes all the rubbish wants to fall out. So how do we do this in an organized way? Uh, we have what's called a forgiveness meditation. The forgiveness meditation a student can take, and they can work on this, and use loving kindness in the process of the forgiveness meditation. They can use the forgiveness meditation first, and then once they clean up everything, their little meta plane is ready to take off and fly. And it's going to fly just fine. But at first, when they start to do metta, sometimes they can't really do it because when they try to go down the runway, there's this big box, and it's in the way, and they start hitting, running into things that are on the runway. In each one of those boxes is someone you have not forgiven, someone who has not forgiven you. There are these hard feelings between parents, between friends, between children and parents that need to be able to let go of. And the forgiveness meditation works. So what we do is we ask the student to um, try a couple of sentences to work with, to start out with. And this is a circle meditation process. And what you are doing with this process when you're practicing is it's a complete process. You are starting out by, I forgive myself for not understanding. That's a good sentence to start with. I forgive myself for not understanding. Or you could start out with, I forgive myself for a particular thing, but it's better to leave it open. I forgive myself for not understanding. That can apply to almost anything. And you send loving kindness to yourself and forgive yourself. And all of a sudden, somebody's face is going to come up, and you see the person. There was an incident in your life. The face, person's face will pop up, and you say, and I forgive you for whatever happened. And that incident, I forgive it for the way it happened, but I forgive you for whatever happened. And pretty soon, that person will say, and I forgive you. And they'll smile at you. They will turn. They will smile at you. Or they will give you a sign. I had a very funny thing happen where, uh, a very funny thing happened once where um, I told the student, you know, this, when you forgive them, they're going to forgive you. And what happened was most of the time the stu student will come to me and say, oh, they smiled at me, they forgave me. And I'm very good, very good. Are you, are you through, I'll say, or do you want to work on it a little bit more for a couple of days? And they'll say, I work on it a couple of days more and make sure it's cleaned out before I start to do the other meditation. This person was from New York and was an Italian who had a big Italian uncle, like, you know, big guy like this, you know. And um, it was an uncle that had a disagreement with her, and she never really got it cleaned up. And what happened was, she kept coming to me saying, but he doesn't smile, but he doesn't smile. And I said, well, are you in front of him or are you behind him? She said, he turns his back to me. And I said, well, what does he do? And finally, she came in one day about four or five days into this, and she said, I think he forgave me. And I said, why? Why do you say that she for he forgave you? <laughs> and she said, I was standing there, and he had his back to me, and he went, eh. <laughs> I saw that from behind, and that was my uncle saying, okay, I forgive you. <laughs> that was my uncle. And so he forgave her, and that was it, and she felt it. She felt, I said, do you feel it? Do you feel a release? And she said, I really feel a release. And I said, okay, well, then you're probably ready. We can start if you want to. Now we'll start on the loving kindness, and we'll start just with the loving kindness, and we're going to talk about this in our next talk, we're going to describe this uh, process of the loving kindness, the way that we're teaching it, so that you get a look at how that's working. I hope this gives you a, a better idea of the Eightfold Path, and I hope that it uh, clears up uh, what we're doing with the term harmonious, and you get a better feeling for the fact we're not trying to just make right 
terms go away. We're just trying to fulfill them by using a gentler word of harmonious, because that's what we want in the whole training. We want to have as much harmony as possible, and that's what we're doing with this terminology. So thank you for coming, and uh, I hope that I will be able to be back with you uh, in just a little while on a couple more uh, explanations, and I'll leave you now. Thanks. Bye.